Καλώ ορίσατε. Καλημέρα. Ε, θα μιλήσουμε λίγο στα αγγλικά, γιατί έχουμε διεθνέ συνάδελφου. Εγώ είμαι ο Κώστα Ομαλή από την Applied Materials. Χαίρομαι πάλι που είμαστε μαζί. Ε, ευχαριστώ, Μανώλη, για την πρόσκληση. Uh, thank you very much for having us this morning. Um, I want to thank my fellow panelists for some flying for a long way to come here. I got here very late last night. Some of them did the same. So if we're a little bit slow getting off the start, please, uh, you know, we apologize. We're all a little bit jet lagged. Um, so thank you for having us. You know, the semiconductor business is changing a lot. Um, we are having huge changes happening, not just in, in the European sector, but really gl global changes that are impacting the way frankly, investments are being made and the strategies that are being deployed to make those investments. So coming in from the tool space, the WFE space, you know, we're thinking about this as a huge opportunity. I was just in a meeting a couple of days ago where the, the industry has taken 30 years to get to 500 you know, billion. It's going to be a trillion dollar business in the next you know, six, seven years, uh, maybe five years. Uh, the EU Chips Act, and I, was, I, was, I wanted to clap in the back as Mr. Scorda was, was speaking, because I think he was saying things exactly the way they should be said, which is the time is now to act. There's a huge opportunity. Um, but we have to move very, very quickly, both as Europe and as Greece, of course. And I think the opportunities are actually very, very vast. In many ways, we see a refactoring of the industry. We see demand in terms of AI, in terms of, of mobility, uh, you name the industry, it's getting very semi-heavy. I started back in Microsoft a long time ago, and we used to think Wintel was interesting between software and hardware. Uh, that's now looking very, very small and very myopic. I think the opportunity for semiconductors is bigger than ever. Um, I want to just take five seconds apiece to introduce my fellow panelists. Um, I'm going to start with my friend here, Rajiv. Um, please say a few things about yourself and introduce yourself. So good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Vijay Rajaraman. I, I'm an associate director at uh, strategy and management consulting firm, Author D. Little. I spent about 23 years in the semiconductor industry, also in senior executive positions, mainly coming from R&D innovation and engineering. And therefore, um, I'm, I'm, it's a pleasure, actually, to participate in this, uh, in this panel. Thanks to uh, Mr. Kostas Malios. I'm looking forward to the discussions. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm John Demolaikis. Uh, I am the Senior Director for Advanced Technologies <coughs> at Cadence Design Systems, which is a semiconductor company focusing primarily on the design of semiconductors. I have been in the semiconductor business for the last 30 plus years, and I have worked with all the major foundries, uh, TSMC, Intel, Global Foundries, as part of my job at Cadence Design Systems. Kalimera, I'm Vicky Loizu, Geniki Grammatas Idiotikon Ependition. For the needs of this panel, we are going to continue in English. Uh, I'm responsible for uh, strategic investments and the development law and all the incentives for investments uh, for the Ministry of Development. My name is Kostas Malios. I run, I run Applied AI at Applied Materials based at Sanatera. Happy to be here with you. Hi everyone, my name is uh, George Dimitropoulos. I'm the General Director for Adveos, Microelectronic Systems, a fabulous semiconductor company which is based uh, in Greece and uh, we are part of this uh, emerging uh, semiconductor ecosystem and really proud of it. Good morning, I'm Dr. Prasad. Uh, I'm from Bosch, India. Uh, happy to be in Greece first time. So I've, I've, I've been to many European countries, uh, I see a lot of potential in Greece. I think it's important that we understand uh, the competency, basic expertise that we have in Greece to utilize that for uh, future-proofing Greece. Bosch is looking up to working in Greece and uh, looking forward for this meeting. Thank you. So a lot of changes are happening in the industry. I'd love to get a point of view on how these companies see it. What you see is both friends and very interested companies from around the world ca gathering together in Athens. Um, I'll start with you, uh, Guru. What do you think is the most significant change happening in semi semiconductors today? I think uh, whether it is semiconductor chips or AI and machine learning, these are enabling technologies for domains to operate. I think we should understand, uh, incorporate word, we call it ST. One is the depth and the horizontals, which means whether it is artificial intelligence, semiconductors, 
it has to understand the basics of domain. For example, I come from automotive industry. Let me probably take a few minutes. Uh, 20 years back, a passenger car was just a mechanical machine, which was just used to travel from point A to point B. Last 10 years, a lot of electronics came into car, which means now a mechanical car turned into an electronic machine. Last two to three years, a lot of intelligence came into cars, which means a mechanical car turning into an electronic car, now what we call it as IoT on wheels, which means in next 10 years, you will not see a car in the form of a car, which means you just get into a car, tell where do you want to go, it automatically takes you there, and you will not drive, which means you have enough time in your car to spend from point A to point B. And you need an entire ecosystem to support that vision. Just a simple example, in next four to five years, every car, every passenger car in the road is expected to generate about 4,000 GB of data per day. Is it shocking? 4,000 GB of data per day per car. Look at the number of cars. Do we really have compute capability today to address such a large data coming in, right? The number of sensors on the car is increasing. Uh, the smartness expected from the vehicle is increasing, which means you are looking at three big problems. One is volume of data, variety of data, and variability of data. To address this, one of the key enablers for uh, taking digital transformation of automotive industry is semiconductor chipsets. Thank you. PG, I know you, you've done a lot of work in the car business. What do you think? Sure. So I would like to compliment actually uh, what Guru just mentioned. I also come from the automotive uh, industry. And basically, there are three uh, major trends happening in the automotive industry. The first one is autonomy. So this concerns autonomous driving, where you need semiconductors. And the second one is connectivity. So basically, again, it's about wireless connectivity, it's about IoT, what just uh, Guru was mentioning. So you also need uh, semiconductors for that. And the third one is quite important. This is where actually car is being replaced from being a mechanical uh, tool, so to speak, a travel tool into, into a comfort or, or some people have called it also as a second home. And this is where mobility comes into, into play and this is electrification. So there is proliferation of power electronics and power semiconductors into a car. And overall, I would say that actually the composition of electronics in a car is going to increase uh, predominantly together with, uh, with the use of uh, electric batteries, for yeah. example. So together, the overall electronics content together with the battery would be about 40% of the total cost of making a car. And this is the significance that is actually coming from the side of automotive. But speaking in general, semiconductor is, is the backbone of digital economy and it's a backbone of innovation as we see it. If, if you are a country, if you are a company, you need to develop competence in the direction of, um, let's say, in the direction of growth, in the direction of advanced technology. And semiconductors are fundamentally enabling all um, advanced technologies, be it in the government uh, concerning digitalization, be, be it in the companies, digital transformation, be it in automotive, and be it in uh, public transportation. So I would say that uh, from my perspective, um, listening actually to, to experts as well as uh, leaders from Greece as well as from the European Commission, I would say that uh, as an enthusiast coming, also having a PhD from microelectronics or in microelectronics and semiconductors, I would say that Greece has to participate um, in the semiconductor revolution. I would say that this was an essential milestone um, as a part of industrial revolution. Now we are in the fourth wave. I would say that uh, we had industrial revolution and then we had, uh, for example, digitalization revolution and now we are in the IoT revolution. So I would say, I would call uh, for the participants as well as the leaders, as well as the panelists, actually to see, for example, ways to proliferate and participate the Greek economy and the ecosystem 
besides and together with the European uh, ecosystem. Thank you. Earlier it was mentioned that the design platform initiative in the, within the EU CHIPS Act is actually an interesting place for Greece to participate. John, do you want to comment on the role of design and particularly... In yes. The uh, well, I am <laughs> come from a perspective of the semiconductor industry, been in that for over 30 years, and I have seen that every so often we go on the different vectors within, you know, that industry. Uh, yes, uh, in the last 10, 15 years, we were in the, what I would say 2D monolithic type, you know, chip type of activities. But now the new vectors that we see in terms of the changes in the semiconductor industry are in the 3D dimension, especially heterogeneous integration of different materials, CMOS and compound semiconductors. And also the other vector which is very much interesting and talks about the economy at scale of semiconductors is the chiplets and of course the architectures, how you go and you measure and you do all that stuff. Uh, looking over the design platform that the European Commission has put in place, I see both of those type of vectors being the centerpiece of those you know, developments by developing center of excellence, pilot lines, and things along these lines, promoting the development of those technologies within Europe and reducing the, the dependence of semiconductors, which in the next five years, let's say even sooner, will be along you know, those two vectors you know, to the various applications. So, the, the European, the, uh, the design platform, as can be said for the European, that the European Commission has put together, is very much in line with those developments, not only in created pilot lines, and uh, I think uh, Thomas uh, talked earlier about IMEC, Fraunhofer, Aleti, and you know, along, you know, along these lines, but also in the industry, you know, as we know it together today. And this type of a development will follow on many applications, you know, automotives, medical, and everything. And the most important thing is really they will increase productivity and reduce the cost of making complex ICs. So as, as I think about some of the changes that were being pointed out, whether it's heterogeneous integration earlier, there was packaging discussed, uh, chiplets and so forth, automotive as industries, other industries that are being impacted. How do you think about it as a global company? How do you think about um, where you invest, how you invest, how you take advantage of this global opportunity? How do you think about that? John, do you want to take us off? Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, <laughs> investments, really is, first of all, is you got to know the ecosystem that you're going to work with. And even in the U.S. that we have a vast economy and a vast industry, and to give you, you know, the, uh, there are about 300,000 worldwide jobs in semiconductor, you know, and U.S. has about 50 or 60,000 of them. Europe, by the way, it's less than 4% of the total you know, population in the, uh, in the semiconductors, you know, professionals, you know, across, you know, globally speaking. So looking at this and where the investments, you know, will go is from the U.S. point of view, since we have a very robust ecosystem, it can be on the design, it will be on the manufacturing, on packaging and testing. Now, and I think Europe at last has the capabilities in terms of they may not have the two nanometer you know, foundry technology, but there are good relationships with TSMC in Taiwan or Samsung you know, in South Korea you know, to remedy you know, those things. Now, closing a little bit more to the regional things about this, let's say Greece, and here is where we're going to talk, the design platform and the elements that goes to the design platform, which is really the design of the, tool, of the tools, and it's a software-based type of activity 
with a low-cost investment in terms of capital, and at the same time, you have you know, a workforce that is well-trained in what I would call soft science, mathematics, you know, analytical science, you know, from the local universities, is probably an area where investments you know, can go to. George, what are your thoughts on investments? How do you think about them? Ah, uh, well. <laughs> given, given all the things that are happening. Yeah. Um, well, it is something that uh, we should welcome as a country to, uh, to have. And uh, as it was said from John and also the previous panel, uh, it looks like uh, within the country there are, all, there are emerging uh, opportunities for uh, multinationals to come and invest uh, to, 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 to Greece. Uh, as far as the uh, semiconductor ecosystem is concerned, uh, I think the main area that we should be in a more comfortable position to attract investments is the part of the design. Uh, John just mentioned a really uh, scary figure that only 4% of uh, professionals for design reside within EU, let alone Greece. Uh, but... Uh, so that's definitely a room for improvement. That's something that we can really grow. And uh, taking into consideration that uh, probably, uh, you know, all, if not all, the majority of the semiconductor companies lie within Hetia. They are predominantly design companies. We have the basis to start building upon. So <laughs> certainly packaging houses or Tesla facilities or fabs is a nice investment to have in the future. But... I think is a little bit far away, as Mr. Skordas mentioned, this is probably part of the 2030 plus incentive. So we have a very clear uh, target where to focus. Uh, and uh, I think we need to get the state aid and the EU uh, uh, policies in order to promote this within EU, but also more specifically to, to the country. Yeah. Vicky, as you think about EU funding, as you think about the Greek situation and the Greek opportunity, how do you think about uh, bringing investment to Greece? What is, what is the role of the government and, and what are your thoughts there? Well, if you, we really want to have a, an ecosystem in microchips and semiconductors in Greece, we need both public and private investments. And uh, CHIPS Act is uh, a strategy and a tool for us to use uh, the European funds, uh, but also we need to mobilize uh, Greek funds, uh, but also private funds. And uh, this is the time because, uh, as already the minister uh, presented, Greece is in a situation and an environment, uh, economic environment that can really attract uh, investments, the st political stability, um, the rates of growth, uh, and all the details of uh, the economy are there. So together with uh, the strategy that uh, Ms. Eftihidu, the Secretary General uh, of uh, Industry presented, that we are uh, working together with HETIA um, it will be really important to finalize some specific uh, incentives for these kinds of uh, investments. Of course, there is uh, the general environment of the strategic investments or the development law, but uh, we are working uh, on to specify specific incentives so as to really attract uh, big investments uh, in this field. Um, let's say that we have um, different kinds of incentives for different kinds of uh, investments in the ecosystem. Um, the Secretariat for Research and Innovation uh, will use uh, European funds and other funds uh, so as to mobilize startups. Uh, and then uh, we will work together to find the right incentives so as to, let's say, change maybe what we really offer through the development law, the strategic investment, so as to really have big companies for the next step. The, if we want to really be, uh, uh, to, to be a, a, in a protagonistic role for the future, we really believe that investments in new technologies is uh, something we need to focus. 
what do you think would be the what, what do you think is the if you will the uh, economic advantage that Greece has? Is it talent? Is it infrastructure? Um, I, I know earlier there was mentioned that Greek has, Greece has changed a lot, which it has. And we've seen this firsthand, and its its readiness to participate in a global ecosystem is bigger and better than ever. As as a government official, how do you see what our cooperative economic advantage is for Greece? Okay, let's say that uh, in this uh, period of time, Greece combines uh, the stability of uh, a developed country, but also the opportunities of a developing one. So the um, uh, stability, as I said before, the economic environment, but also the talent, uh, which is really important when talking especially for this field uh, of uh, microchips and microelectronics, uh, is really important because, uh, uh, but it is not something that we just need to say we have the, the talent. We need to work together uh, with uh, other ministries so as to be sure that uh, we will have the tools uh, for reskilling, upskilling, or uh, uh, use uh, funds and work together with the Ministry of Education and uh, Mr. Kirakaki so as uh, to produce more uh, actually talent. But it is, our talent is an asset uh, for Greece, uh, especially combined uh, with all uh, the general uh, economic environment uh, that we are uh, now happy to live in. Uh, Greece is uh, in the crossroads of three continents, and it is uh, the strategic uh, position uh, that Greece is, uh, gives the opportunity uh, to combine together with, um, uh, let's say, being a hub in energy, being a hub in logistics, but also being a, a, a hub in data. Too many data centers are, are already here in Greece. <laughs> And uh, microchips uh, are used also in all these fields uh, and uh, a lot more. So new technologies is a priority for us and uh, we are determined to do whatever is needed so as to attract uh, the best investments here in Greece. John, we've had a few opportunities to discuss talent. Yeah. We've talked a little bit about how you train, how you, you know, basically bring up education systems that really support the, the infrastructure of people doing their best work. Um, I know you have a lot of thoughts on that. What, what are your thoughts? Yes. Uh, first of all, in any vector that you go to develop uh, something in any industry, but in that in that time we were talking about semiconductors, you cannot be successful unless you have well qualified talent to execute, and also is the supply that you need, you know, for those talent. I can tell you one thing as a statistics, and I was educated here in Greece, and then I went to the uh, to, <coughs> to United States to get my PhD, you know, after that. But a lot, of, a, a lot of talent that we're producing, you know, in Greece, at least a few years back, I'm, I'm not... <coughs> they migrate to the, you know, to foreign countries, and they excel very well. You look at the at USA, and a lot of the deans and presidents, you know, of, uh, there were people that they have been educated in Greece, included in major, you know, companies like Nvidia, Applied Materials, Intel, and things, you know, of that sort. So there is really a very strong potential in Greece in terms of getting the right education and everything, you know, on that. So I will say that if we, if we can really focus an investment that is very aligned with what the, the, the Greek ecosystem can do, and really focus on that to establish a pilot programs and things of that sort would be very good. The talent is there. If we can not only retain the talent here, also prevent from the migration to the other countries, also invited a lot of the talent that is already in Excel uh, abroad to come back you know, to the US. And to add one more thing is really, we've got to think a little bit more globally you know, on that. 
is not only, yes, you've got to have the right curriculums, the right labs and everything, the universities, to be sure that the graduates have all the qualifications that you need. And we do this. But we've got to look a little bit more on this. We've got to go a little bit back to the high schools and really promote a little bit some of the science, you know, over there and motivate at least the good senior high school students to really follow the STEM programs of the science programs within the universities. One of the things we've talked about is Greece has a lot of pluses and some challenges, but I think one of the pluses that it has is software. There are a lot of software engineers here. There's a lot of talent here that can be repurposed, that could be expanded, um, that could actually grow and, and provide services. Um, ADL does a lot of consulting all over the world. You know, when you look at a, a country like this and you think about um, what he can offer versus other markets, how do you think about, you know, when, what do you tell your clients in terms of where and how to invest? How do you evaluate, you know, some of the, the pros and cons of some countries? Sure. So it's actually quite complicated because there are very senior leaders here. I, I wouldn't uh, jump into the <laughs> political side of it or policy making side. And uh, it's a complicated uh, topic. So as, as uh, Vicky pointed out and as John po pointed out, there has to be a fundamental balance between what a country can offer in terms of its capabilities. And uh, I, I would uh, look at it as an ecosystem. So, so basically Greece is an ecosystem. And then as a part of this ecosystem, you have infrastructure, you have uh, education, so basically talents. And then you have few other logistics and, and you have few other uh, avenues here. And basically, these have to match together with the aspirations of the global industry and with the policies of, of Greece as well as with the European Union because uh, some part of the funds are always tied up to the European Union or to the European Commission. And once all these are synergized and balanced, it would be very easier, for example, for a country like Greece to attract uh, investment partners. And talking about partnerships, I think that Greece uh, really has the right capability. And I, I have known a lot of, uh, just like what I would like to join John and say that I personally have seen a lot of uh, very talented uh, Greek engineers as well as managers coming from the semiconductor industry. And every time I talk to them, they always wish that they would be able to do the same job here in Greece. Right? So, so basically, this is a very positive thing, which means that the brain drain has happened. And in order to reverse the brain drain, uh, basically it's a public-private partnership that has to take place. And, uh, and uh, with respect to the ecosystem uh, that you have, and eventually um, it has to start from the schooling. Not necessarily from the high school, it has to go way back uh, than the high school, I think. So it goes back into STEM, as you call in the US, and MINT, as you call in, the, in, in Europe. So engineering and sciences need to, uh, let's say, be developed as a mindset for the children because now, nowadays they are growing up with technology in their hands, in their smartphones, in their pockets. They play video games, so they understand very well. And uh, my son, um, he lives in Austria. He is only seven years old. I was totally surprised three days ago when he told me about chat, GPT, and artificial intelligence. I'm <coughs> totally surprised. I could not, uh, you know, say anything for, for about a couple of minutes because he knows what artificial intelligence and chat GPT can do for him and for his teacher. Yeah. I may add one thing to that. We, we talk about the graduates from the colleges and, and, and also the, uh, the senior high schools, but we should not really undermine really the need for the industry per se of the vocational type of activities, <laughs> what I will call it in the U.S. community colleges, but I don't know how you call them, you know, in the Greek, you know, language, because not every job has to have really a four or five years degree in the semiconductor industry. There are a lot of jobs, for example, programming, that can be very well taught in an associate type of a degree, you know, at a community college. So I know the university system, you know, in Greece to the best, you know, that I'm not an expert, but I think I understand it, but I'm not really 
but sure about big community colleges and things, you know, of that sort, or uh, vocational, you there know, are, training, there are you know. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The EAC is what they call them. No, yeah. no, it's it's even EAC or uh, vocational training. Uh, there are several levels of vocational training. There are yeah. also high school vocational training, yeah. and then EAC or uh, there yeah. is. Uh, <laughs> Supposed to be a higher education, no, yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I think that's another. I think that's another aspect that uh, the Greek government, if there it wants no to develop, uh, this is another Everything aspect is that well, the Greek government if it wants to develop something that whatever is sometimes it's better to do something small and do it right rather than expand and dilute yourself, you know, too much. And I think Thomas, you know, talk about that, you know, very easy, but. You may want to consider really also the state of the vocational, you know, trading. You know, so we respect. agree. We yeah, agree. maybe yeah. to uh, a quick question to Vicky. Uh, there are talents in Greek which are super important for Greece, but working in other countries of Europe. For example, I know a couple of my Greek friends who are Greek nationals here. They are working beyond Greece. In fact, even though they have their homes, they are working in. Um, Germany, Sweden, Norway, but they say the same work which I do here, I may not get paid so much. How do we address this? You have talent, you have to retain that talent, but to retain that, you need to actually compensate them well. So that's it. They always are uh, inherently aligned towards Greece. They say it's our home, but you need to hold them with the right compensations so that they come back and then contribute to the growth of Greece. So how do we handle this? This is a part of investments, actually. <laughs> the more jobs we have, the, the better compensated there will be the talent that we have. <laughs> I also think that the, the multinationals coming into to Greece, they do address part of this issue, right? I, if you go maybe, I don't know, 10 years back, you would say the gap between uh, an EU or US salary to Greek salary would be really vast. Okay. But uh, nowadays, I think things are uh, are getting to you know, to the right direction. And I, I can tell that from first experience as being part of multinational for the last three, four years. And the no example from your case, Costa, and other companies that uh, uh, people do know what's going on in the EU. They do know that they have this luxury to work remotely. And uh, in order to be able to attract them and to keep them here, you have to be also competitive. Uh, and uh, we are addressing it. We're not there yet, but of course, this is coming together with, you know, the state of supporting and. Uh... You know, one, one of the things that I think is important is exactly that: it's equal pay for fair work, right? Or yep. fair pay for equal work, depending on how you look at it. They're actually the same thing. The as a multinational, you have pay scales, and you're used to paying people not just in the local market, but I think about R and D talent as global R and D talent, whether it's in Athens or whether it's in Milan, or whether it's in Hyderabad, or whether it's in, you know, Santa Clara. For me, you know, people produce amazing work everywhere, but you have to compensate them. You have to adjust a little bit for the geo, but you have to pay a lot more than what they were getting paid yeah. for yeah. in Greece, say, 10 years ago. And luckily, that has changed, and that's wonderful, because I think you now have the ability to bring in people that want to live in Greece, that want to work in Greece and be productive here. Um, Bosch has, I think, 420,000 people. Worldwide. More than that now. <laughs> and so you have, uh, you know, an interesting, and you're out of the Indian business, uh, but worldwide, but out of India. You know, how do you think about compensation? Because as we think about, uh, you know, opportunities about where to invest in SEMI, we look at low cost regions, we look at the mix of capability <clears throat> and cost, we look at all those. How does Bosch think about that? Okay, so the journey of diversifying business beyond the country of origin starts with identifying low-cost centers. For example, we call it as global capability center. We don't, doesn't call it as low-cost center, capability center. And slowly over a period of what, time, what will happen is these so-called global capability center keeps on increasing in scale because they are cost-effective and then bypass the source where the problems keeps coming which means the problem statements gets defined by headquarters and uh, uh, global capability center scales because they have cost advantage. And the moment that scale joins experts, which means the volume of people who you have are 
capable of capable of handling business on their own technology on their own that is where uh, the force comes in from both the sides for example i personally believe if you have a right problem statement if you have a right purpose investment is never a problem investment is a problem where you have a weak problem statement where you have to convince people around you to invest right and the fundamental question that we all have to answer here is how do we drive innovation for a purpose for example semiconductor chipsets now innovation is a large word now let's try to make it more simple how today i am actually developing a chip for certain domain of automotive automotive industry now how do i bring innovation it it could be a big word but how do i bring innovation to reduce the cost of the chips a simple product development life cycle in an automotive because we are very 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 functionally safe which means we don't want vehicles to misbehave so any electronic component going into an automotive industry has to go through a lot of certifications which means a typical product development life cycle in automotive industry is about 5 to 10 years now how can we actually now work through innovation to reduce that product development life cycle from an innovation all the way to vehicles on the road how do we increase cost how do we reduce time how do we bring more efficiency and at the same time we should not design technology and products for today we should always be looking ahead at least 5 to 10 years so innovation research investment in right topics surely will bring people back to greece and also it, it is not only um, one factor that will allow it's also as as long as you develop the ecosystem the more you also attract the talent absolutely. back absolutely yeah speaking of developing the ecosystem i think i heard earlier in the conversation that i think greece has to participate in a way in the eu chips act or in the european ecosystem as part of the system and i think trying to compete for example with some of the large rtos the four lines for example that have already been approved uh and working you know and, and getting set up working you know uh, um i think competitive to those could be an impediment what are the things that we can bring as a country i think to the eu chips act as an example which is a huge uh i think economic move uh for the con- uh, for the continent what can we bring as greece how could we work with other parts of the ecosystem to contribute collaboratively um and to help you know makes it make a better whole maybe i'll i'll probably take this question see india has also gone through the same journey of an underdog to a now nearly a superpower a simple example if i can actually quote from a traditional computer science in uh, bachelor's in computer science bachelor's in electronics bachelor's in mass you know mechanical which was 5 to 10 years back now in india we have bachelor's in nanotechnology we have gone beyond electronics computer science bachelor's in robotics bachelor's in ai which means after your basic education you are already equipped, equipped with necessary talent expertise to get into an industry so it it also now depends on governance and the policies to bring that radical change see so there are two types of growth one is called as i think we all know one is called as an organic growth which means we target 20 years slowly prepare the ecosystem towards that target and the second one is inorganic growth which means you you drive certain risks in your decisions but your rewards are equally high which means fundamentally you disrupt the system people who are capable will now automatically come out people pe- people who are capable to address to that change address to that uh, speed will automatically come out so radical change at the education system will also future proof in fact you don't need 5 years 10 years bachelor's program is 3 to 4 years yeah. the moment you bring niche technologies which you need in next 3 to 4 years bring them as curriculum how do you think about bosch india for example how do you think that bosch india completes bosch as a whole as a global company how do you think about the piece that you do in india that is additive to the whole that's what i was trying to get to um as well which is so the question for me is how does greece attach itself to the big movement that's happening in europe around semiconductors and how can they actually 
use their strength and play on the strength to quickly, to your point about organic versus inorganic, to quickly, I think, be both competitive and you know, immediately show progress in, in production? No, I think at a very high level, understanding the direction of technology is important for governments to quickly get this technology is moving in this direction for which this is the necessary ecosystem that we need to invest. You doesn't have to invest on big projects. You need to invest on creating that environment for investors to come and then use it. Mm -hmm. For example, we as Bosch India, we always have an eyesight on what is Bosch Germany doing. Where are the new technologies getting invested? How do we now, for example, they have you know, people you know, scarcity. How do we now ensure that, for example, uh, you know, Mr. Denner sometime back said AIOT company, which means seven to eight years back we declared Bosch as AIOT company. So the moment a, a leadership team says that we are an AIOT company, automatically every team member who just joined in will go with that philosophy that, okay, I have to be an AI expert in the next five years. So that's the thought so, process that we should drive. So Guru, you run AI for, I think, the software division of Bosch, right? Correct. So as you think about Greece, would you set up a team in Greece to, to do what? And what would you do to that point, right? I'm just going to put you on the spot here. He's doing my job. But see, first thing that we need to do is, one... <laughs> Hypothetically speaking. Absolutely. No, no. I, I, think, I think we should, we should be bold. We'll be yeah. in the papers tomorrow, by the way. <laughs> So first thing that we should, we should always look at investing on a new region is one, security, which means if we invest, is my money secured? Second, return of investment. How long does it take for me to recover my money back? There's nothing like charity. Let's accept. <laughs> any company coming into any new geography comes with a plan of making money. Yes. Now, how, how much time do I have to wait to get my money back? And how sustained my business and scalable over a period of time. If I say I come with 100 million, invest in next two years, try to make it 150 million, it's not worth. Mm -hmm. If you say come with 1 billion, make 10 billion, it's worth, take that risk. And do you think of Greece as positively, given the, that context, as, a, as an investment opportunity, as having the right conditions for investment, for successful investment? I think we need to now look, look at this opportunity again from last three days I am in Greece. I'm trying to understand data points. Now, what are the data points which will make me move forward? What are the data points which are giving me cautions? For example, uh, I don't know, maybe it's philosophical. We actually read quite a lot of Greek history in Indian books. For example, Archimedes, Aristotle, Socrates, um, Pythagorean. I think we have a huge uh, respect for history of Greece and talent of Greece. Is that now available for us from universities? Example, I need 6,000 engineers qualified in science and technology for next two years. Is it available here? Yes, if you bought a local company. And that's 6,000. <laughs> you have to scale it up. Yes. I think one of the investment <laughs> modes but is... Then you're going to attract uh, from abroad. <laughs> I have to make let, one. <laughs> oh, let me let George answer the same question. George, you're, you're part of a multinational yeah. I think Chinese company in Greece. How do you think about your contributions to the general strategy as a Greek company, as a Greek you know, um, entity? Uh, I personally believe that... Um, uh, we do, we do have an added value to the uh, Greek ecosystem. And although being part of a, a Chinese multinational, essentially, as Guru said, um, all the multinationals, they're looking certain parameters to invest in a country. Uh, and uh, I think that we meet the criteria to, to do that and to invest further. And uh, if somebody has come here and has ticked all the boxes in terms of uh, you know, sustainability, um, uh, talent. Uh, this is something that it, it is present here. And maybe, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure if we can get 6,000 people uh, within a couple of months to, for Guru, but uh, we will find them if he comes around. Thank you. John? One final point, uh, and for Vicky too. Uh, really, <laughs> what is happening with the CHIPS Act, both in the US and in Japan and in Europe? is a lifetime opportunity. This type of investments, they do not happen, you know, very often. In fact, I'm not sure what happened, you know, 
in Europe, but I know in the US was about 30, 40 years back with the VSEC you know, program. So now is the opportunity, Vicky. <laughs> okay. If you miss it, I think you will miss the boat. <laughs> I think that we will not. <laughs> I, I, I want to I second what John said, and I also actually said earlier, which is, you know, I've been in this market. Um, I'm an American, Greek American, born mm -hmm. here, but I went there as a very young person. Um, I've come back and I've made some, some, I've done some work here. I think this would, the, the point that John just made, and I know that Vicky knows this because we've discussed this, is this is really a point in time opportunity for Greece. Mm -hmm. Things are moving really, really fast whether it's pilot lines and design platforms, investments, VC funds, whatever it is, around semiconductor is a, an amazing opportunity for this country. It's an amazing opportunity for everyone in this room. But we have to move really, really quickly. As multinationals, there are tremendous opportunities about where to invest capital. You know, earlier, the, the, you know, the, the sort of the geos were listed, you know, Singapore, US, EU, Japan, South Korea. There's, every country has a chips act, it seems, India. Yeah. Every country has a CHIPS Act, and every country has a delegation of officials literally going to every multinational on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, peddling their country, peddling what they have to offer. I think for Greece, this is a really amazing opportunity. I think it's an amazing opportunity to move from a, you know, sort of a European market to a global market based out of Greece, and I think this is the opportunity for this industry today. And I do think, as John said, and I know that we've all talked about this, that the time is really right now. I know the government yeah. knows this. Uh, we, you know, we've talked with Mr. Spekas, I was just here earlier, you know, several times. They understand this, and I think uh, you know, the EU understands this as well. So I, I guess the, I know we have to wrap up, and we're running a little bit late. The, 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 the message I want to leave everyone with is there is a point in time opportunity that you have to activate on right now. Within 12 months or 24 months, it's going to all have shifted. Then you can, somebody I think Tamar mentioned, you can go to quantum next, you can go to something else. But I think right now is when you have to, you know, really, I think combine as an ecosystem. ETIA, I think, does an amazing job bringing this community together. I think combine with the government because you need government support. Be a part of the European Union, come together with the EU, provide what you can within that ecosystem and hope. I think the design platform is a great opportunity for this community to participate in a really strong way. Um, other things uh, or other opportunities are less, you know, less interesting and less, you know, frankly, less capable for Greece. But I think there's, you know, real opportunities, at least I believe, that we have to capitalize on. And uh, I just want to say uh, thank you to my panelists. Uh, they've flown a long way. I think we try to bring an international panel of, of people here, people that are genuinely also interested in Greece. So get to know these folks. I want to thank Vicky for your constant support. Um, and for the you. years of you know, support. Um, and uh, I don't want to thank you for your time. We will not be taking a recess because we're running a little bit behind schedule. Um, so we're going to go uh, on to the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.